How was your day, baby? Don't worry about my day. How was your day? Yeah, you like that, don't you? Come, come on up. You come here. Check my sleep in my my tent oh, again. Ah, see. Here, put this on, man. Ah, is it my fucking tent where my heat was off? You gonna grab a cigarette? Nope, no. My shit was you out. Get a hit. No, that heat's off. No fucking oh burn my marks. Oh my god, I'm cold. St. Louis. Let's talk to Bill Seedoff. Bill, you're the director of the city's Department of Human Services, and this uh, this little tent village called Hopeville has been under your skin for a long time, hasn't it? You know, Hopeville and the encampments on the riverfront, you know, have been uh, something that has been a concern for a long time uh, to the city, and uh, we have continued to monitor the situation there, but of course we have never endorsed the idea of having encampments or tent cities. I stumbled upon the tent city while I'd been taking pictures around St. Louis for a photography class. The first person I met there was Wolf, and right away I was surprised by how open he was to an outsider. It appeared that Wolf was in charge of the Sparta camp. He immediately took me under his wing and showed me what his day-to-day is like. It was clear that he was experienced at being homeless. I'm off the ground. I'm just going for the basic necessities. Right, gotcha. It's like if you need, I have a source where if I need something, I call, I get. Right. Right, okay. but I don't abuse it. Right, I understand what you're saying. Because yeah. it's like I try and get tents in for people because I'm, I'm a supplier here, mm-hmm. right? And I so- am still out here to help others no matter what. My camp is drug-free, as everybody knows. No drugs, no child molesters, no rapists, none of that stuff. Because I think I am protecting the people that are in my camp. He introduced me to others in the encampments. The camaraderie and generosity among the residents was palpable. It felt like a real community with people who enjoyed life and cared about each other. I immediately wanted to help out, or at least be involved with this place somehow. From then on, I visited nearly every day, bringing food, water, clothes, and any other supplies people needed. Boy, you ain't no joke, dude. <laughs> be on it. <laughs> this is the life of Wolfville. I started filming to tell the story of this place, but I knew my experience thus far was only a fragment of the reality. So I asked Wolf if I could move in for a while, and he said okay. So the next day, I returned with the tent. Hi, boo boo. I don't know if I want to come down here. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. Let's see. Nah, better not. No, let's see. It's got to be a different way. Not long after I'd moved into Sparta, a homeless couple arrived and asked Wolf if they could stay there as well. They told them that the cops kept kicking them out of place after place and that they couldn't go to a shelter because couples aren't allowed in shelters. Wolf agreed to let them move in. It was kind of odd being homeless for the first time. I don't think I would have made it without Dave. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't have made being homeless. Nah, nah, yeah, because experience is new. 
I had to learn how to cut wood, start fire. Mm. Well, that's my morning exercise. No, I mean, you know, Bonnie, she she's a pain in the ass. I hate to say it. Uh, at times I wish I wasn't with her, you know. At times I'm kind of glad she was with me. When I was first homeless, I didn't have nobody with me. I didn't have to worry about nobody. I didn't have to carry somebody. I didn't have to to feed an extra mouth. I didn't have to clothe an extra person. I didn't have to keep an extra person warm. I didn't have to keep an extra person dry. All I worried about myself. To her, it was a challenge. Yeah, I was, I was scared to death. Uh, when I, and then once I, maybe maybe about three months when I was there, got used to it and hey, I had fun, I liked it. Yeah, I want to get out of Canada so bad. You want to try to attack me from Central America to Western United States? Man, well, as long as I get out of, okay. out of that little brown area, watch it be a one. Be my luck. It's a skip reroll. <laughs> <laughs> See? Okay. All right, done. winter has been one of those that really raised, it heightens our concern, I guess, that trying to exist in a tent, you know, in these kind of conditions, you know, can, can really be very dangerous. Anybody who wants a bed, whether it be an emergency shelter or permanent supportive housing, there is a bed available. We don't want anybody to have to be on the street or to live in an encampment. But as you mentioned, there are certain individuals among the chronic homeless population that no matter what you offer them, they're not going to accept those services. You got the poverty, you've got significant trauma and history of trauma, and you've got the mental health disorder and the addiction disorders that have been untreated probably up to now. You know, the mental health piece is probably the most significant thing in terms of complicating our lives in terms of addressing the needs of homeless people. When you look at the chronically homeless, almost 100% of that population has these issues that they're also dealing with. People are not necessarily just going to show up to your door and say that, you know, my life's a wreck and I hear you're out here and maybe you can give me some help. We know that those who need that assistance the greatest definitely aren't going to be the ones who just show up. A lot of the homeless people in the state of Missouri became our responsibility to try and find housing. You know, and as the old adage goes, homeless people need homes. <laughs> it's out of sight, it's out of mind. And so, you know, if nobody's down there, you can exist. If you're sleeping in a city park, you know, a policeman will come over and tap you on the feet and say, hey, you can't do that, you know, it's time to move on. The quality of some of the shelters that we have in the community are so poor and so undesirable, you know, that a lot of the homeless people, if given a choice between going to a particular shelter like the New Life Evangelistic Center or living on the street, many of them choose the street. <laughs> I'm, I'm here because I choose to be here and not in the shelter. But now, don't get it wrong, if I had a place to be, I would be there. Now, it's obviously, I don't have nowhere to go, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. You see what I mean? You know, I ain't know nothing about this until I became homeless. When, when I first came out here, right, the only thing going through my mind, I think I had like about, about $32 left on me. And I'm like, damn. It's $32 run out. How the hell am I going to eat? You know, what the fuck am I going to do, right? It's a free way of living, man.
the free way of living. My mother used to always tell me, you can't live for free. You know what I'm saying? If she was alive right now, I'd tell her, Mom, you know what? You can't live for free because I've been doing it for eight years. You know what I'm saying? And so has a lot of other people. I've been, I know people been out here 30 years, man. 30 years. Officially in um, 82. I've been on the streets on and off ever since 82. Showed up July 5th of last year. And uh, last year I had umph in me, but I drink a few beers every night, times a year. I've missed two nights last year, but uh, you know, I lost my daughter five years ago to a drunk driver. Uh, this kid, 18 years old, two, three o'clock in the morning, steals his dad's Beamer. He was on the run for three months, scared kid. I was looking for him. Oh, I was looking for him. De definitely I had my dad's service revolver with me driving around Glock 17, Glock 26 sitting there looking for this kid. Now, I wouldn't have heard him, but I was just absolutely furious. You just killed my kid. You know what? Uh, you don't bury your kids. Your kids bury you. You don't bury your kids. That killed me when I, that's all I had. That's all I had was my kid. There are days when I cry in the morning when I'm trying to get myself dressed. I cry, man. I, I tell myself I can't go through this anymore. Beat myself up. My fondest wish would be to start all over. Go back to 1972. This all originated, you know, there was a, a, a group of people that lived in a tunnel. They had been there for quite some time. Uh, there were about 24 people that lived in that tunnel, uh, and that tunnel was slated for demolition, uh, which has now been done, actually, it's been taken down. We worked very hard, our department worked very hard with those original 24 people to assist them to move from that location. Just giving uh, you know, uh, it's Monday. Got a final notice, we don't want to see anybody. By the time that this the situation ended, we had something well over 70 people. Subsequently, we were able to talk to those people and suggest that they needed to move because it was a safety hazard, a dangerous place. It seems that uh, at the instigation of New Life Evangelistic Center, uh, individuals were given tents and directed to move to the foot of Malafi Street. My name's Amy. I like Hopeville. It's, it's a community amongst ourselves. We kind of keep everything together and we take care of each other. Well, we're down here in Hopeville just hearing from the homeless and we want to ask you to get involved and she's asked for pushing bowls and ask you... People had nowhere at all to go at all and it was going to become a showdown over the tunnel. So again, uh, when people are frustrated and desperate and the police were going to arrive and uh, people would have had their heads cracked and been shoved out of the tunnel anyway, so we gave them an alternative. We said, hey, you need tents? Why don't you go down to the Red River where the rest of them were? That was done strictly for publicity. That was the reason that was done, uh, just to gain, you know, the media's attention. This is why he raises money, you know, by creating situations that bring media attention, and then he, you know, is able to do fundraising on that basis. Mr. Sidoff has accused you of sending people down here in harm's way, uh, making them live in Hopeville to get in the city's way. Uh, first of all, there's no truth at all in that. He's never been able to substantiate that. When people ask me for tents, I gave them. When they asked for solar lanterns, I gave them. So are we just moving the problem down to the riverfront, or is there an ultimate end game to help these people? You can bring whatever up here you want. Take whatever you want down there, too. I don't know how to break it up. You know what I mean? You ain't want no chili? Okay, come right here. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Are you living down here? I don't. I have wash clothes, though. I'll give you some wash clothes if you'd like. No, I'm going to go over there Monday. I'm going to go over there Monday and put it in the app up there. Okay. Take care, man. Yep. All right. See you later. Yep. It was really inspiring to see so many volunteers giving their time and money to help complete strangers. I wanted to know what drove them to do this sort of work. We had a friend of ours um, call us 
and tell us that they were going to go down to this place called Tent City, where all the homeless people are, or most of them. And um, you know, asked me if we would be interested. And I'm like, oh yeah, heck yeah. It's a little intimidating, I think. I was a little nervous. Yeah, I'm from I, the county, and we didn't know what. Yeah, we we, <laughs> we, we both grew up in the county, and uh, I know I was really nervous. I didn't know what you should or shouldn't say to them. I didn't want to insult anybody. Right. I didn't want to offend them or anything. I can still remember the first day we went down there and all the people that we met down there. And the yeah, I mean, we were hooked. And I don't know how many times, you know, because we go through a lot of gasoline. We live, you know, 30 minutes away from downtown. And uh, you know how many times we've said, you know, we really need to cut back. And, you know, next thing you know, we're going back down again, <laughs> you know. And uh, whether we have something or not, just going down to hang out. Talk. It's our big, sad vacation. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we, yeah, we don't go to the movies or anything. We we go down and hang out with the, the homeless people. Well, if you don't mind if we don't come out. No, you don't have to come out, bud. Yeah. We'll, we'll get you some. We're gonna give you some sandwiches okay. here. Hey, you need yep. any sandwiches, Wolf? I'm all good, Eric. You sure? Well, I'm positive. What, Trust. Kind of, what, what kind of monstrosity do you have here, man? That is called. <laughs> it's my rain block. Did you, uh, were you drinking when you put this thing together? No, I wish. It you might have went better. Right? It might have went better. I think you were a little delusional, buddy. Hey, but it works. Are you sure? Positive. I haven't been snowed in well, here. My dad was uh, uh, a colonel in the army, and uh, I was mistreated by him. And I've, I lived a rough life, too, but always been working. And... I've always made money, and I made mistakes with my kids. But now, you know, you know, we we are together. We're tight, and, and we're a tight family. And it's 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 a it's a good thing. I love it. I love it. So this is the way I can do right by other people. Give things back. You know, making someone's life better. And I think that's what it really is all about. You're gonna be here tomorrow. We'll try to see if we can get you care of the old man up here. Hopefully, uh, we can get them transitioned out of here and into full-time employment. You know, just their pick up their self-esteem, motivate them to succeed. And of course, my wife called me and <laughs> she said, "The lights are out. Will you come and say I'll help us?" Okay. She goes, "What?" Well, oh. What if about me? I'm gonna freeze to death. I said, for God's sake. I mean, you don't even know what you're talking about. You got a roof over your head. It's 65 degrees in here. Okay, it's 21 out here. That's crazy, man. Well, anyway, so they had a vote tonight and they kicked me out of camp. They just came in for one thing, my bottle of vodka that I've been drinking on all day from my DVD player. They unplugged it from the antenna because it gets TV, and they took it off the charger and took the DVD. It pissed me off that much. I said, I was drunk and in my, in the wrong frame of mind. I said, well, if they're going to take anything from me, they ain't going to take nothing else. And I burnt my tent. The thing that happened was that there was a fire there. Uh, that we were very concerned about because there were four tents actually. One was set on fire which caught others. There was apparently a propane tank thrown into the fire and how no one was injured uh, in that fire is really a miracle because it was a very big you know, fire that could have really you know, been very, very dangerous and could have really probably killed someone had they been in the tents that burned up and four tents did burn up that, that one evening. They kicked me out. I don't have nowhere to go thinking about being a hermit going out on the side of the river by myself, and that's probably what I'll do. I'll give it a couple weeks and see if they want me back yet. I've made it clear, I, I, you know, I've said, you know, this is an all-or-nothing situation. You know, if we have people that are causing a problem in one encampment, that, you know, then everybody needs to leave. Has anybody in St. Louis seen what's going on just north of the Four Seasons 
on the riverfront in downtown St. Louis. And unfortunately, it all falls on the lap of Bill Seedoff, the director of St. Louis's Department of Human Services. I, I appreciate, you know, what people attempt to do by bringing things and supporting people that live there. But in some cases, it really does enable people to maintain a lifestyle that obviously is not beneficial to them or, or to the community. There are 75 people there, and the police have responded 90 times in the last year. It's, it's, I think it's an embarrassment for the nation, an embarrassment for the city. A lot of those people are there because they want to be there. They don't want to go to these shelters and other places where they're in a structured environment and have to obey rules. But not everybody that's down there are drug addicts. Um, there are a lot of people that are carpenters and stuff that are out of work and they've got no place to go. They've lost their home. It's just not a priority. These guys with bipolar, schizophrenia, suicidal tendencies, uh, homicidal tendencies, they're just not the priority. Catherine, you're on KMOX. I've been a volunteer downtown for about four or five years. They're in survival mode. They need what the volunteers do for them. They need everything, whether we're helping them with getting ID or whether we're bringing them food or blankets or tents. They need that. It's not easy living homeless. They have to do an incredible amount to live down there. Um, an incredible amount of work that I don't think we see just to survive. So when we say we come in and we provide all these things for them, you know, we provide a small, small percentage. And the rest they do for themselves. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you the mayor of our Bayer City. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Francis Slade. This is one of my favorite efforts in St. Louis. We are working with and helping people who are the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, people who have nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn, nowhere to, to lay their head at night, and and have a, a, a whole lot of issues in many cases in their lives uh, that they can't they can't deal with themselves themselves. Uh, as many of you know, the city started its 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness in 2005. Since then, it has become a nationally recognized model. I guess my big hope and our what we advocate here for is that we get smarter about the issue of homelessness. That's the problem, is the homeless people aren't anyone's problem per se, or anyone's responsibility legally. So you have the mental health service providers that are out there, you've got the city you know, out there trying to deal with the problem, and then you've got the state, and then you've got the federal government out there trying to deal with the problem. It's such a complex problem dealing with you know, individuals. So here I am, 48, I meant to do something about it 15, 20 years ago. That'd be one of my fondest dreams. Go find my real parents. If they're, you know, they'd be in their 60s, 70s. They're loaded with money or whatever. There you go. Ha! You get to know people and you cry with them. And the very first time we went down there, I can remember meeting Blake. We were almost leaving Sparta. And Blake and, and another guy come walking back being somewhere. And so we had met him the first time and got to know him more and more and cared more and more about him and wanted to help out. Cool people. Yeah, kind of like a mom and a dad, and that kind of sounds stupid for a 48-year-old that's going on 28 still. But it's like, like a mom and dad, man. Uh, something I haven't had in years, bro. You know, he was really tugging our heartstrings and the alcohol was really ruling his life. His mom and dad and his brother have all passed away. And so we went down and got him, and the only place we could for sure take him was, you know, we took him to our house. I mean, it's different having another adult live in your house, you know. I definitely adopted him. I mean, we both have adopted him. Uh, <laughs> through thick and thin, and apparently that is. <laughs> He's my doctor. I will get to, get to your best I, interest, I hon. know, but you go, I think you overdo it sometimes. No, I know for a fact you do, hon. The Clonopin. And it didn't help last time when you ended up drinking. Um, you've had a very good day yeah. so far. They have been a godsend. You know what I mean? They really have. I've, I've caused them a little bit of, not anguish, but, you know, we're all human. Yeah, truthfully, I'd still be out there drinking beer 30. You know, get her done. Fun and games, man. It, it gets old after a while. It really does. What's going on is I need to get everybody's names because they said they're going to do a police check. I don't know if that's true or not. And the 
he told me if there's anyone that you don't think that need, you don't want in the camp, put an X by the name. So far, I don't have a problem with anybody. It ain't none of his business now to what goes on down here. He come down here, I'm pulling the cops in his truck back. Bottom fucking line. And I may have fucking warrant, so goddamn what? It ain't none of his fucking business. It ain't nobody else's business. He ain't get my name, period. You understand what I just said? Yep. Don't bring your head down there and get shit. Don't bring your head down there and get nothing. Don't jump down here and nobody pick. Because I could have killed you in one heartbeat, motherfucker. I can't listen to the fucking radio. I got to hear everything. What it is that me and my girl, we got in a little argument. She went outside, and Wolf was out here talking about, you people need to shut up in there. Shut up. I'm trying to sleep. OK. And then he called my girl a bitch. You ain't nothing but a bitch. That's what made her mad. That's what made her come out here and get in the face. And he pushed her down and pushed Bobby. Bobby came over, and he pushed her down. That's the whole thing. Cops came. I was gonna send him to jail, but you talked me out of to it. And I said, she said, well, I ain't. you did, but we we finna lock him up that night. But you came down and told us, no, don't don't send him to jail, and we didn't. What about him, man? He think he think he thinks that this this camp about revolved around him. I'm sorry he's gone. You know, I'm sorry it had to happen like it did. But he was like I said, he was skating on thin ice. A lot of people didn't like him. I'd never seen Wolf be violent, so I had trouble believing he actually hit anyone. But since I wasn't at camp that night, I couldn't be sure of what actually happened. Wolf was the person I felt closest to at camp, and now with him gone, I didn't feel quite as connected to the place. I also didn't feel like sleeping in a tent anymore, so I ended up running an apartment close by, but before I knew it, I had a house guest. I don't give up. It's one thing I do is I do not give up. Because I got a lot of phone calls to make tomorrow. I got to call Catherine, talk to her about the whole damn situation, what happened. Because everyone has a tension level, but no. Because I know what they want. I know what they're going to do. Since I'm gone, it's going to go to hell up there. It's a golden rule. It's a golden rule, and I broke it. The fact is, you're not supposed to bring him to your home. So it was really hot out that day. It was like 95, and I said, you know, they didn't have any pla place to go. And I said, why don't you guys come in? And um, I let him into the house, and, and they were there for about a week and a half. And they learned my schedule. They knew I went out. And uh, they broke into the house and through my bedroom window, took my flat screen TV, t 20 years of uh, coin collecting. I know that I had to get up the next week I was on vacation and start preparing myself to go back out to the streets and help the homeless again because if you don't go out there and help because of what somebody did, then evil really wins. And I'm not gonna let evil win. You know, I've walked away from this for about six months before and, you know, it was that it just kept calling my name. And I think that's how we know that we are just to be involved with something or someone or that something's ours. Um, you know, in my life, this is mine. For, you know, for now, it may not always be. Um, but for now, it's, it's my thing to just mine. These people are mine. And it makes no sense in my life, you know? I don't have very much money. I'm a single mom. Now that I'm working full time, I don't have time. It, it does not line up with what makes sense in my life at all. And yet I still know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, I've got good sobri sobri sobriety going on. 
Um, I don't know what's ahead of me. I, could be I here. think a comfy bed. This other Call volunteer me. guy had told us that's the number one rule that you don't have anybody to live with you. And the guy that took the people in and ripped them off, it's not like we meet them one day and the next day we're having them move in. Not to say we couldn't get taken, but you know, that's right. like she said, we put our heart, our heart out there to be broken. And you know, if something happened, you know, then we, we tried our best, did what we thought was right. I wanted to help Wolf, but I wasn't sure what it was I could do for him. And I'd started to worry that I'd let myself get too close. I think it just felt good to be helping someone for a little while. My dad has spoken to this a little bit, that he has struggled with this, and he does it very honestly, of uh, how good it makes him feel when he goes. And sometimes he'll say, I have to look at myself for that. You know, when I go down there, I always leave feeling really good about myself. And is that bad? I'm like, I don't think that in and of itself is bad. Sometimes we do feel good because we do the right thing. But I think it gets to be bigger than that for some people. Really, he didn't have a prayer without somebody looking after him. Hands down, he doesn't have a prayer. And um, so, I mean, I will fight with him over and over and over, you know, with the addiction issues or, you know, his bipolar low and trying to figure out a emergency plan when he starts going down, you know. Um, but I'll take that job. I'll take it. It's hard to determine when you're helping or you're hurting. Are we enabling them or are we, you know, helping them? I'm sure we've done plenty of enabling, but we, we mean well, you know, when we're doing it. As much as I wanted to help Wolf, I knew he couldn't continue to stay with me for much longer. Eventually, he found an abandoned spot in the woods, not far from Tent City, where he was able to set up camp. It didn't take long for others to move in as well. It's too small. We were a family. That's what we were down there. We had our own little sections and we were family. It's a little tougher. The only thing we have to fight for is just ice and stuff like that. But as I said, not too far down over here, there's the Hogan house. It's like we don't feel like cooking. They give out bologna sandwiches and, they, and we can go eat over there at noon if we don't feel like going any, going too far from the house. That means, and they serve a heck of a lot better meal than St. Pat's. Yeah. As I said, I knew about it, cleaned it up, and then just moved in. Nobody bugs my stuff, his stuff, and life goes on. Inside, you don't have to survive. Out here, you have to survive. What's the difference with it? It's your animal side, your primal instinct. Your primal instincts pick up when you're out here. You get inside, all you want to do is sit down, sew some curtains, or bake a cake, or, you know. <laughs> it really goes downhill. Yeah. It's hard to get back inside once you get outside. Yeah. Then you start getting lazy. That's mm -hmm. the hard part. You start getting lazy, you start getting fat. Well, I got the TV now. I've got 260 channels. I'll just sit here and watch TV for a week. You know? Yeah. I mean, waking up, listening to the squirrels chatter and the birds chirping instead of an alarm clock. So, it's just one big camping trip, no matter what, where you go and how you do it. Wolf never expressed a fear of living on the streets. Never expressed his desire to have a home. I would argue that probably his reasons for the, all those things being attractive are rooted in failures on the part of other systems and other things that he's come to that conclusion. You know, I'm sure there's a family there somewhere, you know. I mean, there's a mom and there's a dad and there may be brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces and, and everything else. And what a great loss to them. What a great loss that he's not part of their life. We got him as a foster child first, and then, of course, fell in love with him and decided to adopt him. 
his mother, I'm sure, was what you would call schizophrenic. I mean, she just, you know, kept having one child after another. Um, you you invest in a child, you love a child, you give them what you think is going to help them. But there's certain damage in Rick that will never be helped. And part of it is, is, is being a child that was given up by their mother. There's something that is, is inherent in them that they think they are no good. Um, my own mother gave me away, so what am I? Oh, yeah, he had a, he had a wife in Canada, and he had a little boy. Um, but Rick left when the kid was two, two months old. It hurts my heart, uh, but we can't do anything. You know, there's not, you're helpless. I, I like the outdoors, but I, I, I just need to have a place like a log cabin and just get away from the world because I don't, I like the world, but I'm not one for the world. It's frustrating because you are offering what you would think would accommodate uh, someone's needs and yet they're not willing to accept the help and that just is bothersome but uh, understandable too you know in some ways that people just for whatever reason something's happened in their life that they had some experience that uh, caused them to feel that way you know, all you can do is offer the help and they're not willing to, to take advantage of it you know, you're kind of left with really no options they're just people that want to be on their own and live that life you know it's just a matter of well where do you do that how do you do that? Uh, can you do that? Charlie Brennan on The Voice of St. Louis. Well, there was a homicide earlier this week in St. Louis's Hooverville on the riverfront just north of the Four Seasons. And Bill Seedoff, the city's director of human services, is with us on the line right now. What can we do? He's going to shut it down. We have continued to monitor the situation there, but of course we have never endorsed the idea of having encampments or ten cities. And I guess, uh, you know, uh, with the escalation of the murder that occurred there a couple of days ago, uh, that has just uh, added to our concern about uh, that particular, uh, particular area. I don't know. It was stupid and... It was, Robert had been getting picked on, on and off, and people stealing stuff from him for a long time. He was pinned down in his tent, and people thought that he was passed out. Somebody went back, somebody went in there to steal from him, and he was up with his knife. I feel like the last year out there was us commuting learning how to do this thing for real, and now it's hitting reality. I told them, if they come down here, it's not gonna be just Hopeville that goes, or just Sparta that goes, Dignity Harbor that goes. I mean, it's gonna be everybody. I've seen a lot. I've seen so much, you know, in my, my many years that I've done this, but I've never really lost that passion and the importance of trying to do the right thing for people. And that's really what this effort is about. The encampments that we have here uh, are not what we should have. This is not the way people should have to live. And we, we do have something better, we think. And we developed a 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness. And that plan calls for permanent supportive housing. We think that we can help individuals move from this particular location into a better place to have your own place thanks very much folks and uh, please call thanks again it's a good thing you know for certain people you know like me you know like like bonnie and dave fuck the flies fuck the ants fuck the spiders I'm so goddamn tired of walking in this spider web. It's crazy, man. <laughs> We've been down there almost two years, so my time wasn't the first start. I really wasn't ready, but uh, I knew it was time to go. I knew I, eventually I would have to leave, but then when they told me he had to leave, and they tore my house down. <laughs>
Majority people now are in permanent supportive housing. They have a place of their own, uh, which, uh, in many cases, the people down there, and I got to know a lot of the people down there, they hadn't had that experience in years. I think uh, it's, it's really been a life changing experience for the people that are uh, former residents of the encampments in a very positive way. When you're getting used to a life enough, things change. It's going to be kind of different moving to a house now. I got to start all over again. I'm not used to having lights, <laughs> a toilet that you can flush, a stove you can cook on. But I guess it was meant for me to be. Wait, Mom. Huh? Come on. Got to find me a job, look for a job, need a job. I'm going to make sure of that first thing. But I don't want to become homeless again. I don't think I can handle it again. I'm 52. Be fit three soon, so it's time for a new fresh start for me. Before it's too late. Because you can't be homeless all your life. I'm sorry. Some people say you can, but you can't. You know, I always keep a smile on your face. I'm never let nothing get you down. That's something I was not gonna let this do get me down. I was not. I'm not gonna survive this. And I did. Everybody got about you to get a property. Get up off your ass and go find your apartment. You can get an apartment, you know. But now, once you get that apartment, there comes the problem for a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? Because, like I say, some are ready to get up off the streets. A lot of them not. You know, they always say there's always going to be homeless people. We just hope the outcome, at least for these individuals. You know, I can tell you, this is kind of a pilot project. I mean, what we did in the encampments, uh, we'd never done before. This was really our first try at what is considered a different model, a different approach. You know, am I surprised they closed it down? No. There was just too much power struggle. What surprised me is that the $8.2 million that the, uh, they got in stimulus money in the city um, went to renting apartments for a year. So it's a short-term solution like everything else in this city. I'm hoping after a year's time that most of the people that are employable have jobs, can be self-sustaining, and uh, that at the end of this year, we, we see that uh, they're still there and they're doing well and hopefully uh, still leading a better life. I don't know any of these people who are working now. So when they start having to pay their rents, they're up a creek. What do they do then? So now they've had this taste of being in an apartment. Now they're going to have that sense of failure in just a couple months now of not being able to pay their rent, not being able to pay their utilities. They said this would be done in, you know, five years, and their five years was getting up. So you know what, they got it done. Um, someone's gonna write a really good report about that as to how St. Louis got rid of homelessness in five years. A year down the road, there'll be another tent city. We still have some tent cities around the city, and people are trying to survive. We'll continue to follow these people. To work with these people, you know, make sure that they're okay, not, you know, abandon them and say, okay, now we got you a place to live, you know, good luck. I know I ain't. I know I ain't. I just, I just feel it and I know it. My life's gonna be great. I just know it is. <laughs> I'm not becoming homeless again. I just know it and I feel it in my bone. I'm not gonna become homeless ever again.
I thought once, once you're in there, they, they're going to help you uh, try to keep your appointment, try to help you with jobs. But no, once you're in there, they tell you, we done with you. Once they put you in there, you forgot about it. The time's up, we just stayed there until they kicked us out. Then we moved in with some friends. It wasn't a situation we should have never moved in, I say. Then we ended up back down here. We've only been down here, what, about a month now? Uh, sleeping back on the street. I mean, they're doing great. We have our, we have our, our moments, <laughs> as you would say, but we're doing great. I am shocked, I'll tell you the truth, I am shocked it lasted this long. From 2009 to 2014. <laughs> and I would say, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. These ones going nowhere. Yeah, because some people you come out here with homeless with, leave you in a minute. Once they get out here, they, they just leave you stranded. And that day, we ain't stuck to that. We've been homeless twice. We ain't slept in God knows where. <laughs> but we came through it. The winter, summer, spring, fall, we've been through it all. And we still together. Yeah. Chef, hey, come here. Leave the ball. How you walk the dog without walking the dog. People mind sensitive got so low, you know, the first thing they gonna wanna do is just lay up on their ass for two, three months and enjoy the fact that they ain't in the streets no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So but you gotta stay on top of them, which they they wouldn't do it. Ain't nothing cool about it, ain't nothing fun about it, you know, ain't nothing thrilling about it. You know, when I was out there I dealt with it. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and now that I'm back here, I'm going to deal with this to make sure I don't have to go back out there to deal with that. But some people got comfortable with it. Some people love it. Just call me back real quick. All right, bye. And I just wait for him. Because those people should be showing up soon. All right, well, let's, get a, let's kind of get a situation where we want, and then we can demo out what we need. Yeah. He's one of my rescues that I rescued from the camp, so he's one of my boys. He's... I've had him over a year already. Yeah, but he's one of the boys that I rescued. They take care of the rent here. That's $450, and then electricity and everything else. It's inside. <laughs> That's all I can say. It's just because of the quality of the air in here and stuff. You don't get all the fresh air you want, and I was more compatible outside because there's bills here. I said working a part-time job, you it can't really push everything to what you need it to, and you just it's just pushing you to meet more goals now and just step up on into life and just... Make sure everything goes right for you. Come home, feed the cats, change the litter, and <laughs> just sleep. Very much bored because you, there's nothing to do, really, except sit back, watch TV, and just watch the world go by. Out there, at least I could get out more, have the fresh air, and exercise a little more than just having to come here. Wow, I got a bed. I can lay down. As I say, I'm, I'm making the best of it right now. I'm, I'm giving it a shot. That's what I gotta say. Hey Blake. Yeah. Mr. Palm, how you doing? We're trying to complete your recertification. We need three things. Police report, proof of income, your utility bills. Okay. Um turn this off. You're gonna you're it's going up and went from three thirty six to now three forty two. I'm probably gonna go ahead and inspect is there anything working here? Everything's working here. I could probably go ahead and do the your inspection real quick. Okay, help. You um, are gonna point what was your name? I'm sorry. Kevin Major. Kevin. Okay. So Kevin. I mean, Blake, you need to tell Kevin exactly what are your, some of your concerns about this place, just to let him know. Blake has had a, probably like three, three or four months ago, there was a storm and there was water just flooding in his bedroom window. I mean, he was clearing out things, throwing down towels, buckets, the whole thing. And, um, you know, he talked to the landlord about it and it didn't really go anywhere. And 
you know, but he has a really hard time advocating for himself, so that's part of the problem. Okay. We've got to see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. All right, sir. Right. Hey, thank you. Thank you. you have we a good day. We will call, too. Okay. I mean, I'm paying bills, um, trying to save some money, which is, you know, damn near impossible. I get a little stir crazy. I start going through these panic attacks, which come on by themselves. And I'll sit here and probably burn about a half a joint, and it, it really helps me out. God, I just, the pills, I'm an addict. So if it came to a bottle of Klonopin, I'd have them things gone in five days. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm an addict. I thought when maybe when they moved away from down at camp that the drugs and alcohol wouldn't be as bad, but it's just as bad if not worse now. Yeah, it is interesting to see this gift turn into basically a source of stress. I would still be living in Tent City. I really would. I would love to stay right down there in my little house we built. I was safe. We didn't have to worry about uh People come and kick you out your place or none of that. Hey, I, I love it down there. I'm not gonna lie, I miss, I miss it. I really do, I miss my little house and my little kitchen and stuff I had in there. <laughs> Truthfully, we talk about it every day. We talk, I mean, it might be every day. We might, I might say, man, I wish I had our little place. I mean, we had solitude. I mean, it was just a plot of land that people wound up getting and Next thing you know, there's 10, 20 tents down there. And, but I mean, some good times. I mean, don't get me wrong, but a lot of drugs down there. So, psh. I mean, was it a joke half the time? Sure. But yeah, I mean, some of the people were there because they had no other place to go. And some of the people out there are hardwired. That's all they know is the streets, so they're, they're used to it. I mean, I feel sorry for him, but that ain't no life. I've been here, I've been here for a year, but I mean, if it wasn't for Stephanie, I, I would have never got it. When's the last time I actually had a place? Nine years. I love it. I love it. I want to have the guys over once in a while, and I don't necessarily, I really don't want them drinking because I'm trying to stay clean and sober. Do I? drink a beer here and there, sure. Wouldn't want to tell anybody, but, you know. Because <laughs> the choking of the, the loving arms, the loving hands around a person's neck. <laughs> See, that's love. That is real love when you're... <laughs> because if they didn't love you, they wouldn't be doing that. to the question, but I did find myself asking myself, what does make you happy? You know, what is important? I mean, could I live like this? Because there's certain aspects of it that are very, to me, look really good. It would be an interesting experiment to see if we could get the city to establish a legitimate homeless camp, you know, with support. I don't think that the city should look at Hopeville as being an experiment in trying to see if you can have a homeless camp outside. Uh, because you certainly can, you know, it's just uh, just trying to legitimize it. I don't care what people say about the homeless. I just see some people who down on their luck and came home. I'm trying to get back up on their feet. You wake up every morning looking at yourself and the situation that you're in. How do you change your life? Unless people come in and you can make it. We're here to help you. Here's our hand. This is one of the biggest things I've ever been called to do in my life. Our life is completely different than what it was, but uh, I can still go through it all over again. This is KMOX. What about uh, the Reverend Rice's plans to uh, put uh, a homeless uh, community on two acres of land that's visible from an area highway? I think that's ridiculous. I mean, it's just replicating what we already have. Why do you put money on the highway?